So in this video, we're going to be looking at indicators and pH curves, right? Now, an acid-base indicator is usually something like a weak acid, and it's represented by HA, as we know from before. And a weak acid, right, HA and its conjugate base, they actually have different colours. You can see I've got an example, which is going to be methyl orange, where the acid form of the indicator is going to be red, and the conjugate base form of the indicator is going to be yellow itself. And you can see, right, that this reaction is actually going to be reversible. This dissociation is going to be reversible. Now, when we have an equal concentration of our indicator in terms of its weak acid form and as well as its conjugate base form where the concentration of HA is equal to the concentration of A minus right we know the indicator is going to be at its end point and another way to look at this is that when pH is equal to the pKa itself so methyl orange itself right that's going to be orange right that's why it's named methyl orange at its end point because we've got a mixture an equal mixture of red and yellow colors actually present itself right now when we look at indicators they actually change over around two pH units and the end point is usually around the middle of this range as well. Now I've got some examples over here of some indicators that you need to be familiar with but you don't need to memorize and if you were to look at let's say a methyl orange that's going to be red in acid, yellow in alkali and its pH range is going to be between 3.2 and 4.4 as well. Now another common one that you'll come across is phenolphthalein that's going to be colorless in an acid, pink in an alkali and the pH range is going to be 8.2 to 10 as well right you can see we've got different pH ranges. Now how do we actually explain how indicators actually work? Well I've got an example of a question over here. How does phenolphthalein act as an indicator in acid and alkali conditions? Well you can see phenolphthalein Failing is colourless in acid, it's pink and alkali, and so the pH range is going to be 8.2 to 10 as well. Now the first thing that you need to do is you need to be able to write out one of these equations to show the dissociation of a weak acid. And let's say if we were to deal with the colours that we've actually got, in alkali conditions, right, our conjugate base is going to be pink, and in acidic conditions, right, our actual acid is going to be colourless itself. Now let's say if we were to deal with this indicator and we added some acid to this, right, the H plus will actually react with the A minus, and so what that will do is it will shift the equilibrium to the left and we make more HA which is going to be colorless. If that's the case we can say the equilibrium shifts and the indicator turns colorless because it's in its acid form. What about if I were to add in some alkali which contains OH- ions? Well that's going to react with the HA over here and it's going to shift the equilibrium to the right and it's going to turn the indicator pink. Why? Because the indicator is now in its conjugate base form and so that's going to be pink in itself. Now you need to be able to interpret information from a pH curve as well as sketch a pH curve as well and during a titration you actually measure the volume of one solution which reacts exactly with a known volume of another solution. Now in module 5 we actually call this the equivalence point as well. Now if you follow the pH change during a titration by using a pH meter of some sort you can actually see a titration curve that looks like this over here and when you add in base let's say into our acid right you end up neutralizing the acid and so you end up with excess base as you continue to add more base. So if that's the case, right, let's say if I've got an acid, right, I can tell I've got an acid because I've got a pH below 7 and our pH is going to start off over here. So if I've added zero lots of sodium hydroxide, zero centimeters cubed, I've still got a purely acidic solution and we can see, right, our pH is going to start below 7. But as we start to add more and more sodium hydroxide, right, some of that acid is going to be neutralized up until the point where we've got the exact volume that neutralizes the exact acid we end up with this sharp region over here. This region, right, where we can see our pH being equal to 7, right, you can see over here, I've got my equivalence point, this vertical section over here. Now, if that's the case, right, as we continue to add more base, what will happen is, is we will end up with more base than there is acid, and so we end up neutralizing the acid, and we end up with a base in excess, and our pH is going to end above 7 itself, and you can see that's why we've ended there. When it comes to sketching these types of curves, you need to be able to sketch different types of curves depending upon whether you've got a stronger or weaker acid or a stronger or weak base as well and let's say if you were to look at ph ranges right for a strong acid you know ph is going to be below one for a weak acid you know ph is going to be above one itself but below seven what about bases well a strong base is going to have a ph that's going to be above 12 and then a weak base is going to have a ph that's going to be below 12 itself as well so yeah let's have a look at how we can actually draw ph curves and sketch ph curves in an exam well you can see over here i've got a strong base being added to a strong acid so we're starting off with a strong acid and you can see right we've actually started with a ph that's going to be below one itself i've got my vertical section over here my equivalence point and the volume of solution that's actually required to neutralize substance which is going to be 25 centimeters cubed i've kept the volume of solution the same in all these sketches but 
remember to stick with what the examiner actually asks you to do because we're adding a strong base once that comes in excess we end up with our ph finishing above 12 and i've shown it going more towards 14 itself what about a strong acid added to a strong base well it'll just be the same curve but it will be opposite as well and you're probably wondering why we can actually draw straight lines right the examiner actually accepts this just because it's easier to see what's actually going on itself as well yeah and so what we end up with in this case we've got a pH that's starting off above 12 and then finishing right below one itself because we've got a strong base and we're adding a strong acid to that as well two more curves over here right you can see that we've got a weak base added to a weak acid and so in this case right we're starting off with a ph because we've got a weak acid that's going to be above one right i've drawn it more towards five and six and then we've got a weak base being added so we know the ph is going to finish off right below 12 itself and so we end up with something that looks like this the vertical section over here right is actually quite hard to see and so we would normally use a ph meter for something like this and the reason why is because the pH range of the indicator might actually fall out that region itself. What about the next one, right? We've got weak acid this time added to a weak base, so the exact opposite. And you can see again how my weak base starts and how my weak acid starts itself as well. And remember, your x axis will always change depending upon what you're adding to what, right? So, yeah, what if we were to sketch a pH curve for a weak base added to a strong acid this time? So, because we're dealing with a weak base and a strong acid this time, right? We start off with a strong acid, it's going to be below one. The vertical section is going to be lowered this time time and it's going to be shifted down more and you can see that the weak base right because we've got weak base it's going to finish off below 12 itself right so yeah look at the next one strong acid added to a weak base right so in this case we're adding a strong acid to a weak base so the weak base is going to start off with a ph below 12 and then our strong acid right it's going to make it finish off once it gets into excess below one itself as well and again you can see that our curve itself is going to have the same vertical section so then looking at our final two examples of graphs, right, what if we had this time a strong base added to a weak acid? So again, we would have our vertical section shifted up more. And what we can see is, is that our pH, because we're dealing with a weak acid to begin with, right, we're adding something to a weak acid. So we've got the pH of a weak acid. Then if I were to deal with my pH in this case, I know my pH is going to start above one. And once our strong base becomes in excess, it's going to finish off above 12 itself. And then we end up with the exact opposite for our weak acid added to our strong base in this case as well so yeah moving on right how do we actually go about choosing an indicator in the exam well for a titration an indicator is chosen so that the ph range of the indicator or the endpoint of the indicator matches the vertical section of the titration curve otherwise known as the equivalence point now different combinations of acids and bases they give rise to different titration curves which we've seen in our last eight examples of ph curves and let's say if i were to deal with the following two indicators right which one would i actually choose how do i decide well i would first of all measure right the ph of a solution of acid and let's see how it changes now you can see down below over here i've got two indicators i've got methyl orange and i've got phenyl phenylphthalein as well and we need to be able to decide which indicator we would actually use for this titration itself bearing in mind we've got our ph curve which we can see it has the following vertical section where it roughly levels out at this region over here and this region over here as well right so we need to find something that fits within this box over here that i've just shaded now right so you should be able to see that a bit more clearly what indicator fits within that region for its ph range well first of all let's look at methyl orange that's going to be a ph range of 3.2 to 4.4 3.2 is roughly going to be around here and then 4.4 is roughly going to be about here and if we were to look at that right that actually fits within our range itself and that fits within our vertical section so we can actually use that itself what about phenyl phthalein in this case well that has a ph range of 8.2 to 10 if i were to look at that 8.2 is roughly going to be about here and then 10 is going to be roughly about here itself now that does not actually match the vertical section of our ph curve itself and so we know we can't actually use that well how do we actually wear this in the exam well we say to use methyl orange as a ph range matches a vertical section and a color change right matches a vertical section as well so yeah moving on i've got a task for you to try feel free to pause the video and have a go so yeah student adds a total of 45 centimeters cubed of 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide to 25 centimeters cubed of 0.08 mole per decimeter cubed of propylenic acid and they monitor the ph throughout as well 20 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide is required to reach the end point and on the axis given you're asked to sketch a ph curve for the ph changes during the addition of 45 centimeters cubed of 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide to 25 centimeters cubed of 0.08 mole per decimeter cubed of propylenic acid itself 
Now, first of all, right, if you were to sketch a curve, we know the following, right, from simple organic chemistry, that this over here is going to be a weak acid, and this is going to be a strong base as well. Now, we know the following, that we're dealing with a weak acid, so the pH must start below 7, but above 1. So I'm going to start roughly around about here. We know that the volume required to reach the end point is going to be 20 centimetres cubed, so I'm going to stop roughly about here. And then we're going to end up with a curve, right, which I'm going to draw... In straight lines that looks like this our vertical section is going to be above here and we know our end point right is going to be above the pH value of 12 itself as well anything above 12 is accepted but I'm going to go very close to 14 in itself now the mark scheme actually tells us that we need to have at least three blocks three pH units in terms of our vertical section and when we look at right our end point of the vertical section it must be below 12 itself right and then as we add in more base right it can end anywhere above 12 itself now the examiner also tells us that we should have a slight rise over here towards this region over here and then a slight rise from here to here as well and one last thing is is that our vertical section right at a volume of 20 centimeters cubed we know that that needs to go above seven itself as well the majority of it needs to go above seven so that's three marks there then right moving on to b the student repeats the experiment starting with 25 centimeters cubed of 0 0.08 mole per decimeter cubed of a weaker acid hcm and adding a total of 45 centimeters cubed of 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed solution of sodium hydroxide we're asked to predict one similarity and one difference between the ph curve with propanoic acid and the pH curve with HCN itself. Now, one similarity could be, right, is that the end point is going to be the same. We're still going to need 20 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide required to neutralize this. And the other similarity could be is that the final pH itself, right, the shape of the curve after the end point is going to be the same because we're still dealing with the same strong base itself. Now, the difference is going to be because of HCN being a weaker acid. So we know our pH curve is going to start slightly higher up, more closer towards seven itself. And we end up with a short a vertical section if we've got an even weaker acid so we can expect to start over here and then our vertical section would start here and then we'd end up with the same shape for the rest of the actual curve itself as well so yeah moving on pause the video and have a go at the following next two questions so yeah let's say if we were asked to show by calculation that 20 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide is required to reach the end point so let's see if i were to take c2h5cooh and then i were to react that with sodium hydroxide and then i end up forming right my sodium propanoate which is going to be c2h5cooh and that's going to end up forming water as well right if i were to look at that i can actually see that i've got a neutralization equation with one to one in terms of my molar ratios between ethanoic acid and sodium hydroxide now the first thing that i need to do is i need to work out the number of moles of my acid itself which is going to be c2h5cooh and then to do that i'm going to take the concentration times by the volume so it's going to be 0 0.08 times by 24 over a thousand and what I actually end up with is a value of 0 0.002 in itself and that's how many moles of propanoic acid I've got now to find the number of moles of sodium hydroxide in this case I'm going to do right the one-to-one -one ratio between sodium hydroxide and propanoic acid so I know it's going to be just the same as well and so I end up with 0 0.002 moles of that now what about the volume of sodium hydroxide right let's say if i were to work out the volume i'm going to take the number of moles divide by the concentration and so i'm going to end up with 0 0.002 divided by the concentration which is going to be 0 0.1 and then i end up with a value that is going to be 0 0.02 and that's going to be in decimeters cubed and if i were to times that by a thousand right what i actually end up with is now centimeters cubed and so i end up with 20 centimeters cubed in itself and the next question we're asked to calculate the pH of the final solution and if I were to look at right what they've actually done they've added 45 centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide we know that we reacted 20 centimeters cubed so then in that case right the volume of sodium hydroxide that's going to be in excess the one that's not reacting is now going to be 45 subtracting 20 itself and so we end up with a value that's going to be 25 centimeters cubed right now the first thing that I need to do with this then is I need to find first of all the number of moles of sodium hydroxide and so the number of moles of sodium hydroxide right is going to be equal to right the concentration times by the volume is going to be 0 0.1 times by 25 over a thousand and what i should end up with in terms of the number of moles is going to be 
0.0025 moles itself so there's my value for the number of moles now i need to find the concentration now in the final solution because remember we're looking at the final solution not the initial one so to find the concentration of sodium hydroxide what i'm going to do is is i'm going to take the number of moles and divide that by the volume which is going to be right the number of moles of 0 0.0025 because that's what we've got left over and that's going to be in the final volume and the final volume is going to be 45 centimeters cubed out of to a volume of 25 centimeters cubed so in that case what i actually end up with is 70 and then we need to put that in decimeters cubed as well i end up with a value for my actual concentration being 0 0.0357 and that's going to be in mole per decimeter cubed. And because we know, right, when we look at sodium hydroxide, right, we've got one lot of hydroxide ion per lot of sodium ions. So we can say that the concentration of sodium hydroxide is going to be equal to the concentration of hydroxide ions. So I now know that the concentration of hydroxide ions must also be equal to 0 0.0357, and that's going to be in mole per decimeter cubed in itself as well. Now, if that's the case, right, I can take my ionic product of water where I've got KW and that's going to be equal to the concentration of H plus times by the concentration of OH minus. And again, to find pH, we need to find the concentration of H plus. So I know, I know to calculate the concentration of H plus, right, I'm going to need to do KW value divided by the concentration of OH minus ions. And so that's going to be equal to KW at room temperature because it doesn't specify anywhere else that it's not room temperature. So that's going to be 1 times 10 to the power of minus 14 divided by the concentration of hydroxide ions, which is 0. 0.0357 itself i'll put that in my calculator and i end up with a concentration of 2.8 times 10 to the power of minus 13 and that's going to be mole per decimeter cubed in itself and then right i can work out a value for ph by doing the log of that and so i end up with minus log of uh, 2.8 times 10 to the power of minus 13 which is going to be equal to a ph value of 12.55 and remember you need that to two decimal places as well